follow him, but, but he didn't believe he was a guru, and he didn't believe in disciples. So that quickly put an end to, to, to those kind of things. Countries loved what he said, and it's so profound that they tried to claim him. You live here, right? No. You, oh, you live here? No. You know, India, and London, and Ohio, California. Um, government. He, when he would speak, he would speak of all these things, institutions, governments, relationships, and all these things, from such a detached point of view as if they were just a bunch of ideas, as if they weren't real in a, you know, a solid sense, that they were just a bunch of ideas that could, that could be sunk beneath and gone beyond if, if there was enough attention. And as I've gone on in my life, I mean, that's literally the way it seems. It seems like this cause and effect thing is now starting to turn around in the sense that, um, you know, more and more, it's like, as I start to, to just travel the course, or travel the country and just speak about the course and just do what I've always wanted to do, that I never knew what it was, it's just follow this into the very depths and to speak on it and everything. It's just such a joy meeting the people and going into things and, and feeling the connectedness and everything that that everything else is just starts to fall away. And, you know, we, we got into, uh, whether you get into male-female issues, whether you get into um, issues that the world sees as important, um, abortion or gun control or nuclear stuff or political stuff, you know, you, more and more, you start to see things as ideas. And that these things are ideas in my own mind. It's a, it's a radical idea because it just so much seems like, wait a minute, I'm just one teeny little person walking on this globe and there are, it seems to be these vast forces outside of me, you know, economic forces, you know, how's the job market doing it? And um, there are forces like um, diseases and um, uh, nutrition and shortages of water and, and war. You know, when Saddam Hussein started firing his missiles, you know, there was a lot of, oh, what if he goes after the oil and cuts off the oil and that could do this to the economy? You know, it's all like this interdependent um, building a card, a thing of cards, you know, like it's all real teetery. And then one big blow could knock the whole thing over. You know, people talk about nuclear disaster growing up. Generations have, have lived with what if the superpowers would, you know, get into a confrontation. And it's all seeming to be external forces. So here we come to the core, and not only is he saying your mind is causative, you know, that you're responsible for your state of mind, but he's saying that, that the world that you see, the whole thing, is made up in your mind. He's saying, um, like in Lesson 76, he gets real specific, he starts rattling off these beliefs, you know, you believe in laws of friendship. You know, here's that friendship thing. Oh my gosh, I've got beliefs and laws of friendship. Maybe I don't even know my friends as they are. You know, he says that your laws of friendship are all tied in with reciprocity, you know. That's the only relationships we've known in this deceived state of mind. You know, I'll do this, but, you know, you do this, and we'll kind of compromise, you know, seems like a good thing in this world. And yet, compromise is based on a give a little, lose a little. And, and he's saying there's a way in which everyone gains. There's, there's a way of seeing the world in which everyone gains. Um, besides the laws of economics, laws of nutrition, um, you know, probably we, were, we went around the room and everybody could not only give what their diets are, and, but maybe a, a life history and an evolution of their diets. <laughs> some of us have gone through some interesting routes in, in diets. And not only is he... He, he kind of just says, like he said 2,000 years ago, it's not what you put in your mouth that defiles the heart. He, he gets real specific in the course, and he basically says, the laws of nutrition are made up in your own mind. You know, that there isn't some kind of an objective world out there with objective nutrition laws. That, you know, you got to eat from five food groups or <laughs> have balanced meals or eat macrobiotic or this or that. That, that these are laws that are made up in our mind. And, you know, the yogis some of the Eastern answers have kind of, you know, gone, some of them have gone without eating and put Ram Dass's, you know, the story about his guru putting all these drugs down his, down his mouth and just being unaffected by all these hallucinogenics and everything. That, that clearly there's lots of, of 
of those kind of things to point the mind over matter. And that's what Jesus is doing in the Course. He's saying, you have a very powerful mind, and you've given it to a lot of foolish beliefs. Now, I'm going to try to show you what they are, and you can come and see how foolish they are. And when you're able to see how foolish they are, like I did, then you'll have dominion over the earth. You won't be this little teeny thing that's constantly you know, battling and fighting for survival, but you will literally have dominion over the earth. There's a lot of parts in the Course that are, that are mind-boggling. Uh, for instance, um, if this is true, if the world's a projection from my own mind, you know, then, then the, the problem is entirely in my own mind. That there are the national debt and world hunger and, you know, the AIDS crisis and so on and so on and so forth. You know, all these, it seems like there's enormous problems on so many different levels. There's interpersonal conflict. There's, you know, disease where they study it at the micro level, the molecule and the cellular level. They seem to find all these mutations in there. There seems to be problems down there. There seems to be, you know, at the national level, at the global level. And basically, in Lesson 79, Jesus, 79 80, Jesus says there's no way that the problems could ever be solved the way you perceive the problems because they occur on so many different levels that it just would be impossible. But the good news is, is that there's only one problem and there's only one solution. So it doesn't make sense that if there is such a thing as truth, it would be simple mm -hmm. and not complicated. <laughs> so here comes the teaching along with all this stuff that just seems to make your head swim sometimes. If, if you watch the news or you, know, you get caught in this, it seems overwhelming. And here it comes down to one problem, one solution. The one problem being the belief in separation. You know, that tiny mad idea, that little puff that's been given power, that's been, you know, believed in, believed to be true. And that's the one problem. And the one solution is the Holy Spirit that's literally sitting right next to where the problem is in the mind and shining it away. Just like when you go into a, when you uh, go into a dark room and you turn the light on, the darkness is gone. And, and it's, the Course teaches us that as soon as the belief of separation seemed to happen, the Holy Spirit was given as an answer. And the whole thing was solved in an instant. One instant. Not trillions of years, and so on and so forth. One instant. But the mind, instead of accepting the Holy Spirit as the answer, the mind already took off running. <laughs> and was running to the world, running towards the form, terrified, you know. So, it's like the Holy Spirit is constantly in our minds just reminding us He loves you. It's a silly idea. You could never separate from your Father. It's impossible. It's literally impossible. It's this gentle reminder in there that even though the mind is kind of run into form and stacked on layers of complexity to build up all these make-believe laws of time and space and bodies and diseases and, and architecture of the buildings and this constant layers and layers of complexity, there's still this simple little light in our mind telling us that it couldn't happen. It's an, it's an impossible thing. And also calling us to return. You know, calling us back to where we, we truly live, which is in heaven. So, this cause and effect has to be reversed around. And and when the mind is in a deceased state, it needs, it's completely forgotten the Holy Spirit and it's completely forgotten heaven. So it needs to, the Holy Spirit knows that it believes in specific now. Specific now. The Holy Spirit knows that the mind believes in, in bodies and things and objects and all these different kinds of things. And so these are, are like symbols that the Spirit will use to help guide the mind back to that place of abstract knowledge or of, of what the Course called, first of all, the real world. And he uses the symbol to come back. So, you know, that's why it's important for us when we start, first start talking, we were talking about, with Joni, about drawing it back, is that I always throw that out as the underlying metaphysics, and it just seems to be helpful to go over and over it because it always comes back to that. I mean, but it doesn't, it doesn't
doesn't seem that way. If you're if you're having a temper tantrum, if you feel like you've got you got to pay the rent and the rent's coming due, you know that's like well that's a nice story, but you know I need some whole part cash here in a month or whatever. That it it certainly doesn't seem to be what's happening. Things just don't seem to be what they are. But we need to start with with problems that we're perceiving in our lives and then work it back. The first thing you can do if you're perceiving a problem at work or you're perceiving a problem with a relationship or, or whatever is remind yourself this is a perceptual problem. You know? In other words, instead of trying to define the problem as the situation, you know, as I don't have enough money to pay the rent or, or as my boyfriend said he would leave me you know, if I don't do this and I, I can't do that, so what am I going to do? Or you know, it's rained for three or four straight days and I'm getting going out of my mind waiting for some sun, you know, and, and I'm frustrated. But those are all defining the problem as a specific situation. And the first thing you can do is just remind yourself that this is a perceptual problem. The way I'm seeing it is the problem. There's nothing inherently wrong about what I'm, what's going on in the world, the way things are unfolding. The national debt may be going billions, trillions, ah, but I have a perceptual problem. AIDS may seem to be spreading and spreading and spreading, ah, but I have a perceptual problem. I need the rent money in two days and I don't know where I get it, ah, but I have a perceptual problem. <laughs> you know, if you could just remember, ah, it's a perceptual problem. And, you know, I give some examples of this to try to bring it home a little bit. Um, I gave the example at the group about, um, you know, going to a movie and, and ten people seeing a movie and then afterwards you go out to, to eat or have a cup of coffee and you hear all these, well, what do you think? Well, what do you think? You know, <laughs> I like it. Well, it didn't do much for me and, you know, here we go down the line. Um, also, I gave the example of when I was, uh, my sister got married and she invited me to her, her wedding party and, and uh, it's, I just, it was one of the first times in my life where I really went, perception, <laughs> like I got a grasp on what perception means, it sounds like one of these psychological words, you know, just like projection, well, what are you, what are you talking about, projection, you know, give me, give me some concrete examples, but <coughs> I was sitting next to the TV, and, and all these people from all these different generations who were invited to the wedding party were there, and they were all watching the TV, and I couldn't see the TV, and basically, I think it was Eddie Murphy Raw, it was a, it was a video of him with this, this and that, and I, I'm looking out, just watching all these faces turn red, and lips getting tight, and, and you know, face, eyes shifting around, so some of it like, you know, embarrassment, humiliation, some of it just outright anger and rage, my brother-in-law falling onto the floor, just rolling over laughing, and it's kind of like a, a a painter watching the scene with canvas full of, of emotions or different reactions and, and thinking they're all watching the same images and they're all listening to the same sound and look at the variety of them. I mean, it clearly came to me that, that obviously they were reading, they were each seeing something different to have such diverse reactions and that they were giving the meaning to those sounds and to those images. It wasn't that the images were making them laugh, making them you know, cry. That's the backward thinking again that we've all grown up with. You know, you hurt my feelings, and you know, if you had done what you done, I wouldn't be so hurt. And they had their perceptions from based on their own past experiences, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they were comparing it with whatever happened to them or something like that. Yes. So then, um, then what could you say about um, perceptions? I mean, as far as what you do is not, I mean, just kind of separate yourself from the past, you know, and just try to be here now and not think about the past, you know, how can you do that? Well, that's exactly, that's, that's the next thing we'll go into, because it's, if you can first just say it's a perceptual problem, I mean, that's like lesson two, I've given everything I see, all the meaning, then we can take some of the early lessons of the course, and it's like they'll light up, because what these early lessons are about is literally helping 